Okay. Good morning, everybody. We welcome you to the pre congress workshop on research methodology of the annual academic conference of uh, Ceylon College of Physicians 2020. Research methodology workshop has become a regular event in our conference program for the last several years. That's a very encouraging thing. And to see the interest it has generated among our young physicians is very, very encouraging. And, very, and we as seniors, we are very happy about that. As you know, we in Sri Lanka, we have enough clinical material to do good quality research. And we believe this research workshop on research methodology will be an initiative for you to start good clinical work, clinical research in your future practice. Today, we have a very eminent panel in discussing this uh, topic. And we are fortunate to have them. And I thankful, I'm thankful to them for coming forward at this juncture, in this uh, critical juncture, with a lot of difficulties. Uh, to share their knowledge and experience on research methodology with everybody. Uh, and I wish to thank the chairpersons, uh, Professor S.T. Jayaratne and Professor Saman Gunatilaka for chairing this session. And I will hand over the mic to them to uh, go ahead with the program today. Thank you. Thank you, Ananda. And, uh, we we uh, welcome Professor Jarat and myself, welcome all the delegates who have joined online for this, as uh, the president said, the very important pre-Congress session of the annual conference of the Ceylon College of Physicians 2020. Uh, this is a very useful symposium for the young physicians and young trainees who needs to do research as a compulsory part of their training and also even afterwards. Uh, we have seven speakers. They are top researchers in the areas in, this, in Sri Lanka today. And to start with, uh, it's my pleasure to introduce Professor Janaka Disilwa, who is a pioneer researcher in the country and he's my good friend, and I know all his work, and they are top class. And he's the ex-director of the PJM, and currently the professor of medicine at the uh, University of Kalania. Janaka, over to you. So my topic today is how to get started in research. And for me, I wonder why I have to give a talk on how to get started in research to people who are already doctors and probably even if junior into their postgraduate studies. And I feel that the reason for this is that the research culture was not widespread in our country and even in some universities. And together with this, there was a poor allocation of funds for research. I feel that both of these uh, negative things are changing now. And the reason that I feel there was a, a, a deficient research culture was that the emphasis on our undergraduate teaching was didactic rather than creating an environment of self-learning. So the induction of students in the spirit of inquiry, the philosophy of science, the importance of multidisciplinary research and so on was lacking. And this led to most of the research done even in our universities, being descriptive, safe, dull, unoriginal research. And this type of research ended up presented at small local meetings and was very difficult to publish. 
So why should doctors do research? Why should we change this culture and ask the question, why should doctors do research, all doctors? And the simple answer to that is that doing research helps a person to learn scientific method. And learning scientific method, even if you don't do research in the future, helps you to evaluate another person's research critically. Without knowing scientific method, you can't even assess another person's research. And if you can evaluate other people's research and other papers that are published, this will assist the practice of evidence-based medicine, which in turn leads to the most important thing in our lives, professional lives, and that is to improve patient care. So why do people really do research? And I think there's a combination. A lot of people do research because they have to do it to get their promotion to senior lecturer and professor and so on. And for you postgraduate trainees, you need to have a research project before you are board certified. Some people actually like to do research. And most often, it is a combination of the have to do it and like to do it that makes people actually get into research. So to my topic, how would you start a research project? Very briefly. The first thing you have to do is you have to choose the area of research that you want to work on. And that is the problem to which you want to find an answer. Now, this is sometimes difficult because if you join an institution or department which has already decided what area of research that department is going to be working on, then it is difficult for you to say, this is what I want to do. Because departments and institutions have their own research agenda and you become part of that big research program which happens to us when we go abroad and we do research in PhD programs and so on. So to be able to do your own research, what you like to do, that choice is rare. And if you are keen on doing that kind of research, what you have to do is you choose that area of research and then you have to search for a supervisor who is working in that area, who can help you in that area of research. So when you choose this area of research, when you choose the question you want to answer, there are two important things that you have to consider, especially in a uh, lower middle income country like ours. First is, is it relevant? Because if you do irrelevant research, funding will be very difficult to find. Is it relevant? Is it relevant to our country? Is it relevant to the practice of medicine as a whole and so on? And the second question is whether it is feasible. Do we have the expertise to do this research? Are there resources available to do research? For example, if you are thinking of doing a very complicated genetic study, then we won't have the resources in this country to do that kind of work easily. Once you decide this is the area you want to work on and uh, you feel that it is relevant, it is feasible to do it, the most important step is to acquire a comprehensive knowledge of the chosen area of research. If you don't do this, you will fail. You must acquire knowledge in that area of research. And to do this, you have to do a literature survey, reading papers, 
recent reviews, looking at references and so on. And there are many search systems now, Index Medica, CD-ROM systems, internet search engines, much easier now than when we were medical students and young doctors. And a good uh, exercise when you start a research project would be after you read the literature to write a well-referenced essay on the topic. So after you do your literature survey, you write a well-referenced essay on the topic. And this will help you when you write to focus on that chosen area of research acquire historical data that is past work done so that you don't unnecessarily repeat what has been done previously identify the unanswered questions in that area of research that you have chosen and then among those unanswered questions decide on what you think can be investigated or develop your hypothesis. And at this stage, I think it is important to seek advice. And you should get advice and the opinions on your essay and what you have done so far from a supervisor, a senior colleague, and also a statistician. And one of the things I want to bring out at this stage is don't forget the time factor because all our professional careers are time bound. A senior registrar will have a year or two to do the research project. A PhD student will have longer, but not forever. So you must do research that is feasible because you have to finish this kind of research in a certain amount of time. And with the supervisors or the senior colleagues and the statistician, you must now discuss the details of the project. What is the objective of your research? That should be clear to you, if it is going to be clear to the people who you show your project to. And there is this rule of thumb that the more objectives you have in a research proposal, the more likely it's going to fail. So have a few objectives. Don't have a lot of objectives when you decide on a research project. You must discuss methodology, what type of study it is, whether it's a lab-based, using human subjects, retrospective or prospective, whether it's a hospital-based or a population-based study. If it's a clinical trial, how you will randomize people, the details of lab tests, medications, and so on and on. There are lots of details about the methodology you have to talk about. And it is very important to involve a statistician at the very outset, because for things like sample size calculation, what tests you should use in the analysis of results, you must not uh, delay those uh, kinds of uh, details because otherwise your study may fail because the number of people you selected for the study are not enough, you have used the wrong statistical test and so on. But while you do this, you must not forget ethics because all research must conform to accepted ethical standards. And there are lots of uh, websites and papers that you can read about the declaration of Helsinki and so on. So ethics and of course the budget. You must be able to develop a detailed breakdown of the expenses that you think that will be incurred during this uh, proposal without forgetting the inflationary uh, things that happen in our country like ours. So you must learn to budget the thing properly. And why budget? Because quality research is usually not possible without proper funding. And to get proper funding, you must learn to write a convincing grant proposal. So that is a very important part of starting a research project. 
you must learn the art of writing a grant proposal seeking funds and here again i want to say you must remember ethics because ethics approval is a prerequisite to receive funds from reputed funding agencies so mr chairman chairpersons uh, ladies and gentlemen if i may summarize what i have said on how to get started in research i feel that the first thing is to choose a research project that is relevant and feasible without forgetting the time factor and if there is no other thing that you remember from this talk the most important thing in starting a research project is to acquire knowledge regarding the chosen area of research and that is a literature survey i found when i was doing my phd that writing an essay before i started my phd project helped me to focus and identify the unanswered questions and choosing the questions that i wanted to answer and so on you can't do it alone especially when you are young discuss the scientific details ethics and budget with supervisors and senior colleagues and remember if you want to do a study that has a very good chance of getting published in an index journal try to secure some funding and for this you have to learn to write a convincing grant proposal which itself uh, should be a topic that uh, this seminar should cover thank you yeah mic on no? thank you janaka for the excellent uh, introduction to how to start research now for the audience i would like to say that there is some thank you for again for trying to uh, stick into the time and uh, there is some time left for questions you need to type in your questions in in your link and send it through the chat box so if you are, have any questions please send it now till the questions uh, come i would like to you know uh, in appreciation of his contribution on behalf of the college of physicians to hand over the certificate please you can type in your questions now and you send it you have to type it you can't speak you have to type it and send it through your link to the chat box if you have any questions from professor janaka yeah i don't think there's any message just coming through so uh, yeah thank you janaka then okay. we'll uh, one question one question sorry hold on sorry send it here from uh, dr pasindu fernando no sorry one before that yeah uh, from dr. Rita Sarojini, to, Rita Sarojini, I don't say the doctor or not. He says, please elaborate on sample size calculation. So I feel that that will be done by uh, the, the speakers who are coming after me because the details of methodology will be done in the, the, uh, the subsequent uh, talks. Okay. The next question, the, we have another question from Dr. Pasindu Fernando. 
who asked what are the things to consider regarding the journal publishing media yeah so uh publishing your research in a journal so what you're asking me is how to choose a journal and i think professor senaka is going to talk on that the simple answer i don't want to avoid answering all questions so the simple answer to this question would be try to publish publish it in an index journal and in all instances avoid predatory journals okay yeah to follow on that how how do you recognize a predatory question, uh, journal um talking about the young people how do they uh, what kind of hints what advice is it being done by yes yeah, that's good so is going to is are it, you doing that says, you're doing it. yeah he's doing Senegi is going to do it. Senegi will uh, there are lists uh, sir yeah. there are lists of predatory journals that uh, are available on the internet and from the invitation that you get <laughs> usually almost begging you to publish in the journal and uh, having to pay a price for publishing <laughs> and so on and repeated emails okay and and even the english there is wrong sometimes yes. even the, yes yeah. and funny names of people yeah. yeah they're not indexed anyway yeah they are not indexed they are not indexed they managed to get indexed in yeah. certain and then they <laughs> get this yeah okay i think that we... yeah i last that uh, what are the funding agencies uh, as our president ask what are the funding agency that our registrars can apply to so the the biggest funding agencies for scientific research are the national research council and the national science foundation however there are funds available in universities for research individual universities as well as professional bodies like colleges also give some amount of funding for research that is limited in scope so for example for a senior registrar who wants to do a small study or a survey as part of the requirement for board certification i think money from a college or a professional body should be more than enough for a small study like that okay All right Thank you, Janaka. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. You want to introduce the next? See, it's it's coming from. Is he there? Oh, he's, he's on online. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. We now. get on to the next talk of the day or of this morning and let me uh, introduce dr udul helge he will be speaking from melbourne australia he is a senior consultant physician in the division of medicine and critical care and he will talk on critical appraisal of a research paper over to you dr thanks saman uh, at that outset let me thank uh, the ceylon college of physician and uh, uh, the president you can't and hear, no? uh, can't hear can you hear me now yeah can yeah can you all right, all right. Uh, thanks saman at that outset let me thank uh, Uh, Sri Ceylon College of Physicians, its president and the organizing committee, to uh, invite me to give this talk today. So I'm going to talk to you. Um, let me share the screen. Can you see the slides? Yeah, we can see that. Okay, right. So I'm I'm going to talk to you. Uh, on critical appraisal of a research paper takes 25 to 30 minutes i'll i'm going to skim through the background followed by uh, why a critical appraisal is important and then um, in the interest of time uh, i will um, 
um, do only the critical appraisal of randomized control trial. The reason being that when you browse through the journals, um, the, the most uh, the common type of article that you will encounter is a randomized control trial. And this is followed by some take home message. So critical appraisal, it's a systematic process um, used to identify the strengths and weaknesses of a research article in order to assess the usefulness and validity of a research finding. The most, most important thing when you uh, critically appraise um, a research paper is to evaluate the appropriateness of the study design for the particular research question or the aims of the study. Now, if we go back to, in time to 17th century, um, when the first uh, scientific medical, scientific journal, not medical, just scientific journal was published in 17th century, um, over the course of next um, three centuries, there has been an exponential increase in number of scientific journals. As a result, the new, um, the medical research articles Publish each year um, continue to grow. Um, Make a win, net, you know? Can you can you hear me? Yeah, I no? can hear you, but I don't okay. know whether you can see you. I'll just screen it either. Just a minute. Huh? Yeah, I'm I'm on the screen. Right. Okay. Your okay. yeah, screen is on. Yeah. Okay. You can go ahead. Yeah. Okay. okay. All right. So, um, if you look at the, um, the, the medical uh, research article. Um, there are over uh, 12,000 medical research article out of which in excess of um, 300 articles on randomized control trials are added to a Medline database each week. So these data uh, speak for itself and as practicing clinicians, we are overwhelmed with, uh, with evidence and information. So having a, a critical appraisal skill will enable us to tease out what is important and what is relevant and what is accurate for our own clinical practice. Unfortunately, we cannot rely 100% on papers published even in the, the most prestigious medical journals. Um, this is what Professor Richard Smith, he is former um, British Medical Journal editor-in-chief. He said, uh, most of what is published in journal is just plain wrong or nonsense. And it is impossible to do research uh, without limitation and most of the research do have methodic, methodological flows. Um, and also remember that uh, there's a component of conflict of interest as well. In this day and age, um, big pharma companies are, are funding most of the, the randomized, uh, the multi-center randomized control trials. Unfortunately, they do have, uh, they do have a vested interest and that's something that we need to keep in mind. And therefore, when you, when you read an article, don't just read the conclusion and draw, uh, draw, um, your, your, change your practice based on the conclusion. And when you read an article, please do so with open mind and critical eye. So critical appraisal skill will help you to deal with this information overload and to identify research papers that are clinically relevant and also to practice evidence-based medicine. So when you browse through the medical journals, you will come across a hundred and thousands of uh, uh, clinical trial or research articles. And it's important to identify what is most relevant for you. So it is important to identify and understand the research question first, and then decide whether uh, this is relevant for your practice. So this is subjective. Um, the paper should also address an important issue uh, in your clinical practice. And also 
you need to decide whether a particular research paper is adding new knowledge and ideas or strengthening existing knowledge. When I say strengthening existing knowledge, sometimes same, same um, research can be repeated and, and get the, the similar results that will help you to improve your confidence and thereby you can apply it in your clinical practice if, it, if that is relevant to you. Or the same research can be repeated in a, in a different population, thereby improving the generalizability of, of that research finding. Or in other words, you, you may be able to apply this research finding into a much more bigger population. Why critical appraisal is needed? So if you, your critical appraisal skills will enable you to, to assess the validity and accuracy of the study. What do you mean by validity? Validity refers to the study methodology, um, how it, its appropriateness to answer the study question or the aims of the study. Accuracy um, refers to the final results and how close the final results to the, the true results. As you know, when you do uh, say a randomized control trial, we cannot include entire population um, for, for, for your study. So you need to, to select a sample, which hopefully represent the entire population and then you carry on with your study and, and you get your final results. If the final results are closer to the true results, then um, that's what you, you expect. And then you can apply that results to a bigger population. So the, the, the critical appraisal skill also will help you to identify the strength and weaknesses of the study and recognize any potential bias and also help to assess the usefulness and clinical applicability of the study. So when you look at a research paper, or when you read a research paper, um, first thing that you need to do is try to identify the research question and try to understand what the, um, the researchers try to do here. And well-developed research uh, question should define the population, the intervention and the comparator along with outcome uh, very clearly. For example, so if you want to test, uh, say, hypothetical drug A um, in, a pa uh, in patients with type 2 diabetes, and you want to, to know whether it improved the cardiovascular mortality and morbidity. So the population here is patients with type 2 diabetes. Intervention is your hypothetical drug A, and comparator may be placebo or another anti-diabetic medication, and the outcome would be the cardiovascular mortality and morbidity. Um, in general, uh, research questions um, falls into uh, two distinct categories. Um, the questions uh, related to effectiveness and questions about the frequency of events such as uh, prevalence or incidence of, of a disease or um, any other clinical syndrome or risk factors or prognosis, etc. So if the question is about the frequency of event, the study method, the most commonly and appropriate study method is the, the observational study method, which include, say, for example, cohort study or case control study or a cross-sectional study. If the the question, however, is about um, the effectiveness of um, uh, an intervention, the, the, the randomized control trial would give you the best bang for the buck. So unfortunately, randomized control trials are not always feasible or ethically appropriate. For example, if it is a major surgical procedure, is the intervention that you want to test, it, it's ethically not appropriate to do a sham a surgical procedure, or you may not be able to blind either the patient or the assessors uh, for, for the, 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 the treatment as well. So these are some of the limitations. However, uh, you may have to modify your randomized control trial design to suit your, your um, research question. 
Uh, let's take a deep dive into the topic of critical appraisal of uh, randomized control trial. Um, as the name implies, randomized control trial, um, one of the strength of RCT is the, the randomization of patients to, to different groups. Um, there are a number of ways uh, the randomization can be done. If you look at the method section, it will give you more details about the randomization and you need to determine whether proper randomization has been done. Most of the multicenter clinical trials um, use uh, a more robust centralized computer randomization process. The reason for using proper randomization is to avoid selection bias and also confounding. If the randomization process works well, you will have uh, um, different groups which are very similar um, in terms of known and unknown confounding factors. So why you need to have similar uh, patient group is that if, the out, if there is any uh, significant difference in the um, outcome of interest between the group, then you can attribute that difference to the intervention that you use because the only difference between the, the group is your intervention. Um, once you have done that, then you need to decide uh, whether the groups are similar at the start of the trial. So if you look at the baseline, baseline characteristics uh, table, you can get a rough idea as to whether the groups are similar at the, at the beginning of the study. So once that is done, uh, then you need to decide um, whether the group groups are treated equally. If you look at under the method section, it will give you uh, more details about the follow-up schedules and permitted additional treatment. And um, in the result section, you can decide uh, the actual use of these different um, intervention and treatments. And ideally, uh, the, there should not be any difference um, in addition, besides the intervention of interest between the groups. Once um, you look into the, 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 the different treatment uh, between the groups, then you need to decide whether uh, all the patients who are enter the trial, have they been accounted for? Or in other words, um, were there any significant loss to follow up? So the, most of the time we try to minimize the, the loss to follow up, but sometimes it's inevitable. There is certain percentage of patient will not um, go through the, the full study period. Um, if the loss to follow up um, uh, percentage is less than 20, um, the bias is minimal, but if it is anything more than 20%, uh, there, is, there could be a significant bias. And this number, this magical number of 20% is, is, is very arbitrary. And um, uh, it depends on the, uh, the number of outcome. If the number of outcomes are lower than per predicted number of outcome, even less than 20% dropout can bias the results. So it is very important to look at how many patients were lost to follow up. And also the author should give a bit more detail about the reason for, for loss to follow up as well. Is it due to side effects of the medication or any other problem or early deaths or whatever? It should be very explicit in, in, in the, the article. So once you have done that, then you concentrate on um, analysis, analysis of the, uh, the data and were they analyzed in the group to which um, the people were randomized. That's called uh, intention to treat an analysis. Um, it means that the, 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 the patients were allocated to a certain group um, at the end of the trial should be um, accounted for when you analyze the, the data. So these details you can, you can get when you read the results section. So then look at the, um, uh, the blinding side, uh, whether the clinicians or the assessors who, who um, assess the outcome and the patients, are they blind to the treatment that they have received? 
So it's called double blinding. This is again um, important to uh, mitigate the bias. Um, it's very important to look at the outcomes in detail as well. Uh, some of the outcomes are measured uh, subjectively and some are objective. Say for example, if the outcome of interest is pain, there's no way that we can measure pain um, objectively. It's a very subjective. Hence the, the blinding of both assessor and the, and the patients who are in, in, the, in the trial is become extremely important. Whereas if the outcome of interest is death, it's a pretty objective assessment. So the, uh, the blinding of the assessors become less critical. And the other important thing is that whether these outcomes are clinically relevant, are they clinically relevant hard endpoints? Say for example, so if you are, if you are uh, testing um, an anti-resorptive medication or anti-osteoporotic medication, so if the outcome is, um, is bone mineral density, you need to ask yourself whether improving bone mineral density translate into more harder uh, endpoints like fracture reduction. And there are certain medication, just because it increased the bone mineral density, it doesn't reduce the fractures. It be, then it becomes uh, clinically not very significant, that kind of uh, intervention. So uh, whether the, the outcomes were measured objectively or what outcomes are measured, are they clinically uh, relevant outcomes are the two important things that you need to look at when you look at the, the, the outcome measures. Let's talk about the treatment effect. Um, in um, randomized controlled trials, the, the treatment effect or results are expressed as you know, dichotomous outcomes, uh, yes or no um, uh, uh, type of uh, outcomes that something has happened or not happened. And dichotomous outcomes can be expressed in a number of ways, um, such as relative risk and hazard ratio. Uh, and in, in randomized control trial, the, one of the, the most common way of expressing the results, uh, dichotomous results is relative risk. What does it say? It tells us how many times more likely that an event will occur in the treatment group relative to the, the control group. Relative risk by itself, if you look at only the relative risk, um, you have to be very careful when you draw conclusion. And you, it can be at times misleading, and it can exaggerate both benefits and harms. And unfortunately it doesn't change with incident rate or it doesn't have a direction. So therefore you cannot draw firm conclusion based on relative risk alone. I'll discuss this in a bit more details in later slides. Usually relative risk uh, is given along with the other measures like um, relative risk reduction. It tells us reduction in the rate of the outcome in the treatment group relative to that in the control group or ab absolute risk reduction is the absolute difference in the rates of event between the two groups. It's also called risk difference. Um, calculated by um, subtracting incidents in the exposed group uh, from uh, subtracting incidents in the unexposed group from incidents in the exposed group. Uh, one upon absolute risk reduction will give you the, uh, the, the number needed to treat. So it tells us number of patients needed to be treated with the experimental therapy to prevent one bad outcome. Usually this include a time period as well. Um, let's look at relative risk, um, how it you know, can be misleading in different population. And this particular uh, hypothetical population, the outcome of interest is very high. So 80% of people without intervention will have the outcome. When you um, treat this population with uh, your intervention, uh, you can bring it down, the outcome of interest will come down to 40%. So your relative risk is 0.4 divided by 0.8 
is 0.5 or 50% reduction. So it's very significant reduction. And risk difference is minus eight, that is 80% minus 40% is, is 40%. So risk, relative risk reduction is 40%. And number needed to treat is one upon 0.4, that is 2.5. It means that you need to treat two to three patients to say if the outcome of interest is, is uh, uh, mortality. So you need to treat two to three patients to save one life, say over a period of X number of months. But if you repeat the same test, uh, same trial in, in a different population, now the, the um, incidence uh, of the outcome of interest is not 40%, it is 20%. Uh, if you don't treat it, but if you treat with your intervention, it will bring down to 10%. The relative risk hasn't changed. It is 50% reduction. See what happened to um, risk difference or absolute risk reduction and number needed to treat. The risk difference now is not 40%, it is 10%. Number needed to treat is now 10, not two or three. So how it changed depend on the incidence of the outcome. That is why relative risk on itself, um, it's, it's very difficult to interpret without uh, other measures. Then you need to look at um, the precision of, of your, your results, how precise uh, the final results are. Um, the precision, you can, you can look at the confidence interval and decide the precision. So what is confidence interval? Confidence interval is in fact, um, as this cartoon mentioned, it's not 95% um, confidence that something will happen and only 5% uh, chance of uh, coincidence. That's not the way you sort of interpret confidence interval. Confidence interval is uh, assume that the null hypothesis is correct. Uh, if you repeat uh, the same trial, lots and lots of times and um, uh, the 95 percent of the computed confidence interval would have the true value so that is the proper interpretation of confidence interval so it in fact tell us the variability around the true value and narrow the confidence interval the better precision is and if you use large number of uh, people in a study, so you can get a narrow confidence interval. Confidence in interval also provide us information about statistical significance. If the confidence interval cross the null line, so it indicate that the results are not statistically significant. Again, you have to be very careful when you interpret uh, p-value. P-value on its own, uh, you should not give a lot of emphasis and p-value should be interpreted along with um, relative risk, uh, real, uh, absolute risk reduction, number needed to treat, and also along with confidence interval. And this is um, a wrong way of, of expressing p-value. You should not um, um, say that it is less than uh, 0.05. You must give the, the exact value. Lastly, you need to decide whether the results of a particular trial or particular study, uh, is it applicable in your clinical practice? It's also called external validity or generalizability. Before you apply this evidence into your own practice, ask these three questions. Is my patient different to those in the study? If the study population is very similar to the population that you deal with, then you can apply these results to your patient population. Number two is, will the potential benefit of treatment outweigh the harms? As any uh, treatment, it's important to, to analyze the risk and benefit. And if benefit outweigh the risk, then uh, it's easy for you to decide uh, on applying the evidence to your, your patient. And also you need to, to ask yourself, is this particular treatment, is it feasible in your own setting? Uh, if it is very expensive or very sophisticated, requiring multiple other um, uh, you know, um, personal 
to implement uh, a, a particular treatment strategy. It may not be uh, practical for you to use it. So it, just because something is statistically significant, it doesn't mean that it is clinically significant. So you need to distinguish these two concepts, statistical significant versus clinical significant. So in summary, critical appraisal is a systematic process used to identify the strength and weaknesses of a research article. It also provides a basis for decisions on whether to use the results of a study in a clinical practice. As we discussed, different study designs are prone to various sources of um, bias, and you need to, to use different tools to assess different study methodologies. Lastly, assessment of other factors such as appropriateness of statistical analysis, the legitimacy of conclusion and potential conflict of interest are an important part of critical appraisal process. Thank you for your attention. Thank you. Hello. Yeah, thank you, Udul. Thank you for that excellent uh, talk on critical appraisal. Uh, we have, we may have some questions, Udul. So uh, hang on there. Yeah, I, I can hang on. Yep, no problem. Yeah, and uh, so I'll ask the audience if there's any questions, you can type in, type in and send it through the uh, link to the chat box. And we can ask the uh, the speaker to answer you. Till we get some questions, Udulla, I just want to ask you something. Uh, do you think that for the budding researchers about these, they should know about this consort statement and the strobe statements regarding uh, clinical trial and the observational trials? Is that useful? I, yeah, I think I think it is important to have every clinician, uh, every practicing clinician. Um, uh, should have, I think, sound knowledge of uh, research methodology, not only to, to do research, but also interpret uh, the somebody else's research and, and the application of these, uh, these research findings to clinical practice. I think this, this knowledge is extremely important. I mean, if you want to practice proper evidence-based medicine, uh, I mean, this is part and parcel of, uh, should be the part and parcel of medical curriculum. And there, yeah, are, there are a number of other, um, the resources available. Uh, there are guidelines which were published in, I think JAMA not, not long ago, will we'll give um, a lot of information about how to, to critically appraise different study method methodologies. So I just discussed only the randomized control trial. So uh, when, you, when you analyze the other studies like cohort or case control, they, they are, um, there are different tools and the way you approach is, is different as well. There's one question from Dr. Pasindu Nandu. <clears throat> I think he you know, already partly answered that question, but he's asking, are there any online tools which may be used, useful or used in clinical yes. appraisal of research? That's right, online there tools. are. There are online tools. Um, the one that is, uh, I think, very sort of clinically friendly is the one that was published in JAMA. I can, I can text uh, all the details if, um, if needed. Yeah. Do you have any reference to that, you know, any to that journal? It's a JAMA, I can't, remember, I can't remember. The, it's not a statement. No, it's not a statement like. No, no. It, it, these are guidelines published by JAMA. Okay. I can email if if he send me his email address. Okay, we'll ask him if possible to send it to you. Yeah, he's thanking you. His email is passing the. 9091 Pasindu P A S N. Okay. Yeah, I can email him. 9091 gmail.com. Have you got yeah. it? Okay. Yeah, Thanks. yeah. yeah. Anyway, thank you, Dul. Uh, we have to no give problem. you a sort of a certificate. Unfortunately, you're not here yeah. to give certificate. So, so when I come to Sri Lanka, when you. Yeah, 
I don't know if there's a possibility in the future at the moment. Probably, probably not. Take over, probably not. So anyway, whenever you come, we'll probably hand it over. <laughs> right. Thank you very much. Thanks. <laughs> okay. Thanks. Anyway, we'll, uh, on behalf of the College of Physicians, we, uh, you know, appreciate your contribution. Thank you. Thanks. Yeah. the third speaker of the day, and that's uh, Professor Patmesaran. He's uh, the professor in public health in the Faculty of Medicine, University of Kalania. And he will be talking on the study design. Over to <laughs> Professor Patmesaran. Thank you, Chairperson. And, uh... I should first thank the college for inviting me to do this presentation. Uh, I will be talking about study design, not all study design, but a selected few designs and some practical aspects of using these designs. Um, what I can do in this half an hour is give you a foundation based on which you can develop your ideas on study designs, but it's not possible to master study designs in half an hour. So I will start with the overview of study designs. You, you may have seen different uh, classifications of study designs. I like this one because I developed it. And uh, it's uh, because it starts with your study objective, right? Your study, selecting your study design should start with what your study objectives are. And uh, so it basically, whether you have a hypothesis or not, that is the first question you should answer. If you have a hypothesis, then the next question is whether you can control the exposure or not. So if you have a hypothesis and you can control the exposure, you do an experimental study and in clinical medicine, that is a clinical trial. And if you have a hypothesis, but you have no control over exposure, you can do one of the analytical observational studies, which could be either a cross-sectional analytical study, a cohort study, or a case control study. But there are situations where we don't have a hypothesis, there is not much known about something, and we want to do a study on that, and that will be a descriptive study. And then the basic, the fundamental descriptive study will be a, uh, the fundamental descriptive study will be a case report, and if you have a few, a series of case reports, you will have a case series. And also if you are interested in health outcomes or risk behaviors, you might do a cross-sectional study. But I'm not going to cover all this. What I'm going to cover in this presentation is a little bit on cohort studies, case control studies, and clinical trials. What I can do is I can talk about the design of these trials, different designs and uh, the fundamental aspects related to recruitment of participants, assessment of exposure and other factors, assessment of outcome and uh, the basis of analyzing the data and some of the common problems and solutions we practically face in implementing these designs. The, when we do a research project and uh, find, come to conclusions, there are two fundamental things that are important. One is on the participants, the selection of participants, the number of participants. The other one is the information we have got, the information on exposure, the information on outcome. So these are the things we we'll have to concentrate when we are doing a research project. So the cohort study is an easy to follow or easy to understand design because it starts from exposure and ends up with the outcome. I mean, we are interested in why things happen. We want to explain, we want to predict. And this is a easy way of looking at things. You start with something, follow them up for a period of time, and then you end up with an outcome. So how do we recruit people for a cohort study? The recruitment can be based on location, the sense where people live, where you uh, or it could be based on an occupational group, or it could be even people who were born at a particular point in time. Right? Wow. Usually we are very concerned about representativeness of most of these studies, but uh, if you look at uh, the 
most well-known cohort study, that is the Framingham study, that is not really representative of the US population or anything like that. It's just people living in a suburb or a town in Massachusetts in the US. Right? So it's not, I mean, in Sri Lanka, we are trying very hard to have cohort studies involving a representative sample of Sri Lankans, which will be very difficult and uh, on a long-term basis, almost impossible task in a country like ours. But uh, for most questions, you don't need a representative sample in that sense aspect, right? You can do it with very limited samples. And uh, say you don't need a both cohort of people who were born at different years to uh, do a study. You can just use one particular birth year and do the study, right? And uh, once we do this now in, Framingham probably they had a very small population and they included everybody over a particular age group they included, but in most instances we need to do a sampling and uh, then the question of sample size arises. I can give you a very broad answer to the sample size question that is now when we are doing an analytical study, we are interested in showing some effect, right? So the sample size will depend on the size of the effect we are interested in showing. So the effect size is very important. So in a cohort study, the effect size will be outcome in people who were exposed to the particular, particular exposure and those who were not exposed, but is the difference in the outcome in terms of the incidence rate? That will be the question. So for most analytical studies, it is the same sample size formula that can be used to calculate sample size, but we have to remember that it is an analytical study and there are two groups because I have seen many proposals where people have just used because the first sample size calculation you know is where you are trying to find the prevalence of something with a particular confidence interval and people just reproduce that sample size calculation for any samples, any type of study. So that is not the way forward. You have to think about it and do it. So how do we decide what, how big it should be? So it depends on how many outcomes are expected over a period of time. Right? So the follow-up period and the number of outcomes will be going hand in hand. So how long we have to follow up will also depend on the, say this uh, COVID vaccine trials, I suppose they calculated the sample size based on the number of outcomes. And the fact that in the US they had a, second wave, very, very strong second wave produced the results probably a little earlier than they expected. Right? So some things are, even though it's bad for the people involved, but for the people doing the vaccines, it was a good thing that there was a strong second wave. Right? And uh, what we need to do is document the exposure status at the beginning and uh, follow them up over a period of time and ascertain the outcome. And uh, these outcomes, the advantage of a cohort study is you can look at more than one outcome. So when we do this in a large cohort study, in the looking at a lot of things, it's, we have to be very selective because we can look at, we first need to have a description of the study population. So things like age, sex, education, income, all these matters. And how do we get this information, whether it is going to be self-report or some of it has to be based on documents is important. Then we may be interested in their habits, behavior, and we may want to administer some questionnaires or scales to look at their psychological status, stuff like that. Anthropometric measurements, hematology, biochemistry, imaging. So if you are interested, there are lots of things you can document, right? But then we'll have to decide on what is the suitable period people can wait in your, for your baseline assessment. You can do your baseline assessment in more than one sitting, but that is logistically difficult. If you need to, you can, but otherwise it's very difficult for patients. So these are not even patients in the cohort study. They are free of any outcome. 
it's very difficult for them to stay on for a very long period. So maybe a one hour is maximum you can do. Then when you do a long-term cohort study, you have to decide on how you are going to, what sort of biological samples you are going to take, what are the analysis you are going to do right now, and whether this, in most instances, these will have to be stored on a long-term basis, whether we have the capacity to store them in long-term. And then, I mean, it's not the storing, it's storing and retrieval, right? So we may be able to store it, but never be able to retrieve it. Then the other question about the cohort studies, which is very important, is how do we manage the data, right? Data entry should be, as soon as you collect the data, it should be entered and cleaned. And uh, there should be ways of storing this data carefully and uh, retrieval is important. So in a cohort study, we usually do regular follow-up say on a month, on an annual basis, something like that. This could be every year, need not be a personal visit. It could be over the telephone. In some cohort studies, because of funding limitations, there may not be annual follow-up. Every few years, there may be a follow-up. But if we have good uh, records, we may be able to do record linkage and find the outcome assessment. Right? So if you have a good health services record system, all diagnosis of a stroke or cardiovascular event can be reported somewhere. And uh, if we have some unique numbers, this can be linked. Or if we have your national identity cards and the death certificates linked, we can even look at uh, vital registration and look at uh, outcomes. So the good thing about cohort study outcome assessment is outcome assessment is not based on their exposure status. So there is no worry of some people being assessed too carefully and some people not being assessed very much. So we do, don't get that problem with cohort studies. But one of the main problems in cohort studies is loss to follow up. Right? So especially if you are going over the years, there will be people who will not turn up and we don't know what happened to them over the period. So there are two ways, or there are several ways of dealing with it. One of these is we just carry forward the last observation and use it in the analysis, or we do a survival and use a survival analysis technique where we can use the observations up to the last time the person was seen in our analysis and uh, do the analysis. The other issue is uh, now so lost to follow up. There are several ways of dealing with it. The other issue with cohort studies is people can change their exposure status. Say if you want to do a study on use of face masks and uh, risk of COVID infection, you can look at people at a point in time and ask them about their mask wearing status. And then if you follow them up over a period of time, during that period, I mean, if it is a cohort study, there is no guarantee that their status will remain the same. I mean, they might start using masks more often or they might reduce their use of masks. So that is a major issue with cohort studies in when dealing with exposures that can change over a period of time. I don't know the answer to that question, but we have to be aware of that and should be able to include that in the analysis in some way. So this is the basic analysis of a cohort study. What we have is two groups. We have two groups. One is the exposed group and the other one is the unexposed group. And we are looking for the outcome in the two groups. Right? So we have the total number of exposed and among the total number of exposed, how many got the outcome. So that can be calculated. And then the incidence among the unexposed is calculated. And uh, we calculate the relative risk. Incidence in the exposed divided by the incidence in the unexposed. So this is a very simple, intuitively easy design, but the problem is we need to follow up a large number of people. We need to follow them for a long period, depending on what the study is on, and there is loss to follow up. So the question is, why bother with all this trouble? Why not start with the cases? So that is the easy way out, or at least it looks like. So that is the case control study where we start with cases, people who have already got the condition we are interested in, 
and uh, look back about what they have been exposed to in the past. So in that sense, it's a very efficient design, right? We can start with the number of cases, but then again, there is a problem of case definition, right? What is a case? Now, if you even things like COVID-19, a case could be just PCR positive, a case could be PCR positive and one symptom, or a case could be PCR positive and some critical symptom. So it's uh, not all cases are equal. That is the thing we have to remember. And uh, a definite case definition should be there and uh, use it based on that. Then in addition to the cases, we need controls to do the case control study. So from where do we find the controls? The controls, I mean, because we are getting the cases from the hospital, it's easy for us if we can find the controls from the hospital, right? But it's not always possible or always appropriate to find the controls from hospitals because people who get admitted to hospitals have some problems themselves for other reasons, right? So it could be hospital patients, it could be hospital visitors, right? But a better approach could be if we can afford it to find community controls, right? And it also depends, the next question is how many controls do we need? So that will depend on uh, whether the cases are easy to get or difficult to get. So if we have uh, a condition which is not that uncommon and recruiting cases is not an issue, the most uh, efficient design is to have a one-to-one -one ratio of cases and controls. So we can have for each case a, a control. Right? The other question is whether do we do matching or not. Matching is uh, done to make sure that there isn't major differences between cases and controls. But uh, it will be also a problem if we have more than one factor to match on. If there are several factors to match on, it may not be possible to find an appropriate controls for some cases. Right? So now the next question is, we have found the cases and controls. How do we find the exposure? Okay, exposure assessment can be based on history, asking from people, or it could be based on records. If they have good medical records, we can go through the medical records and find the exposure status. Um, or it could be even say, if it is something like blood groups or something, you can always test for it and find the exposure status. But in a case control study, we can't calculate the incidence rate. There is no way of calculating incidence rate because we have not followed them over a period of time to calculate incidence rate. But we can calculate the odds of exposure among the cases and odds of exposure among controls. So once we calculate the odds of exposure among cases and odds of exposure among controls, the ratio of these two will be the odds ratio. So that will be now, some people try to remember this by writing this, uh, doing this table and remember it as AD divided by BC, but it, it, uh, the issue is whether you have written your A, B, C, D exactly the way you need to write it. So the way to remember it is to construct a case control table by having cases and controls as columns, and cases should be the first column and controls should be the second column. And exposure and unexposed, not exposed should be the rows. Exposed should be the first row and the non-exposed should be the second row. If you have constructed it that way, a cross product ratio will be the odds ratio. There is no problem of remembering how to do this. So if you do matching in a case control study, the issue to remember is the analysis should take into account that it's a matched case control study. So the table will look slightly different. That is, we'll be looking at four pairs, right? Cases exposed and controls exposed, or cases not exposed and controls not exposed. These two cells, A and D, do not provide much information. There is no difference, right? So we are looking at the discordant pairs. They are the cases exposed and the control is not exposed and or where the case is not exposed and the control is exposed. The ratio of these two will give us the odds ratio in a matched case control study. Um, 
the main problem with case control study is confounders and uh, confounding is the relationship between an exposure and the outcome being distorted by a factor that is associated with both exposure and outcome right so if you uh, say i have seen some patients in the ward who have cirrhosis and these people are smoking so i think smoking causes cirrhosis and i want to do a study on smoking and cirrhosis so i look at uh, the outcome is cirrhosis exposure is smoking and luckily i also know that alcohol causes cirrhosis so i look at the history of alcohol consumption in these two groups right we know that smoking and alcohol consumption go together and alcohol is a strong risk factor for cirrhosis so if we can see whether this relationship between smoking and cirrhosis exist after we have accounted for the alcohol then it is we can say that smoking causes cirrhosis so to do that first i should know that there are other factors that causes cirrhosis and that i should have the data or i can do restriction in the sense i can do this study either among the people who don't drink alcohol right so i can my sample is among those who are not alcohol consumers is there an association between smoking and uh, or it could be among heavy drinkers i can do it among heavy drinkers i did or i can do matching so i have got a case of uh, uh, cirrhosis who is uh, an alcohol consumer therefore i will get my control also as an alcohol consumer or the third option is i just get all the data and during analysis i can do a modeling in the sense it's a multiple logistic regression one of the variables will be the alcohol uh, pattern so these are the three ways we can uh, account for confounding but the problem is we should be aware of confounding at the beginning otherwise we can't do at the end but right the last one i want to talk about is the randomized control trial right it can be for either prevention or treatment and we also have two different types of trials usually we talk about superiority trials that is we have a particular agent we want to show that it is better than the current therapy or it is better than the placebo but in time to come once we have got established treatments we might have something else which is easier to administer or cheaper and we are not trying to show that it is better than the existing treatment we just want to show that it is uh, as good as the existing treatment right so that is a possibility and we should be aware of that and usually we need a larger sample size for these are non inferiority trials and the justification for clinical trial is uncertainty around the research question that is either there is lack of evidence or poor quality evidence or conflicting evidence so a good uh, topic will be the role, role of uh, hcq uh, hydroxychloroquine in uh, covid 19 but the problem is we are not sure whether it is to prevent covid 19 whether it is to prevent serious forms of covid 19 so that also should be so all these uh, studies will have to have ethics clearance and if you are doing a trial it should be also registered in the in a uh, publicly publicly observable available clinical trials registry and the sri lanka clinical trials registry is such a registry so and the registration should take place before the start of the trial so it, there are once you have got the protocol there are just four steps you enroll the patients allocate them to treatment follow them up and do the analysis so enrollment will depend on you assess eligibility look at inclusion and exclusion criteria and explain the study to the patients provide information and obtain their consent the next step is random allocation and uh, this could be based on a centralized allocation system or you can have just sealed envelopes but there should be allocation concealment in the sense people who are involved in the trial at the grassroots level should not know where the next patient is going to go or what the next patient is going to get right and we should also record the treatment received because it's not always the patients receive the treatment they were allocated to so we should do that and uh, in the follow up we'll have to look at loss to follow up and in some cases there is discontinued intervention that should be looked at and there can be 
interim analysis. The interim analysis should be pre-specified in the protocol. That is the main thing about interim analysis. And uh, at the analysis happens as intention to treat analysis. That is patients randomized into the two groups should be analyzed as the two groups. Or that is the first analysis. And once you have shown that there is an effect, you may consider per protocol analysis, whether it is the effect is more in, a, in the group that really followed the protocol or not. And once we have shown that there is a difference in the overall analysis, we could also do subgroup analysis. So this is uh, what all I have. So we looked at uh, cohort studies, case control studies and clinical trials. If you are really interested in reading more about this, there had been two series in the Lancet. Uh, they call it the epidemiology series, but they really have uh, things on uh, clinical trials and other study designs as well. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Thank you, uh, Professor Patnesaram, for that uh, excellent exposure on study designs. And uh, for the audience, we have, uh, if you have any questions to Prof. Padme Saram, please type it and uh, send it through your link. Meanwhile, I'd like to thank Prof. Uh, Padme Saram on behalf of the of College of Physicians for your excellent uh, talk. And uh, I'd like to hand over. I'm sorry, I have no place to keep this, so I have to bend it. And the last. Any questions? All right. There's a one question from uh, Dr. Pasindu Fernando. How to negate the effects of our outliers in the final results or to minimize its impact? Uh, out, outliers, 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 yeah, outliers yeah. can be real or can be a problem with the data. So first we have to check whether these outliers are there because of Say check the data to make sure that there had not been any data entry errors or measurement errors. And in, once you have clarified that, uh, it's not uh, appropriate to exclude outliers in the analysis. You have to use them in the analysis and maybe afterwards there can be a secondary analysis leaving out the outliers. But uh, in the primary analysis, if the outliers data is, you are convinced that the data is not uh, there is no problem with the data, they should be used in the analysis. Okay, the next question is, is asking the same question. What are the pros and cons of using Google Forms in using cross-sectional studies? Google Forms can be used if you know how to produce a safe Google Form, which is, uh, this is Google Form to collect data from others or for you to enter the data, that is the question. If you are collecting from others, these are not very good uh, data collection techniques because we have no control over how people use these forms. But you can use Google Forms to maintain your own database. And that is uh, possible if you construct it properly. Okay. There's another question from Jack, uh, Chaira Pereira. Who, who did you link Cohort study, why did you, why did you, sorry, it should be why. Why did you link cohort studies to descriptive studies in your classification? Yeah, cohort studies, uh, by definition, it's we are following up a group of people with a common exposure to see what happens to them. So if we have a hypothesis that a particular exposure is related to an outcome, then we will do a cohort study with two groups. One is exposed to the exposed to the factor that we are interested in and the other group that is not exposed. But there are situations where we may not know anything about it. We just want to know what happens to some people who have a common, uh, say, say, if I want to know what happens to everybody who was admitted with the TIA 
over the next uh, year, that will be a descriptive cohort study because I don't have a hypothesis as to anything. I am not going to compare with anybody else. I have a group of patients who were admitted with the TIA and over the next year, what happened to them is my... Uh, so it's not a comparison, it's just follow up of a yeah. group of patients yes. with a certain exposure. Yes. That's fine, okay. Yeah, I think that it doesn't seem to be any other questions coming through. So I would like to thank, uh, I've given you already so thanks. I'd like to thank you anyway, thank you. Yeah, so we come to the next talk of the day, and that will be given by Professor Chandini Manikatunda. She is a professor of pharmacology uh, in the pharmacology department at uh, Faculty of Medical Sciences in University of Sri Jadhanapura. And she will talk to us on how to obtain ethics approval expeditiously. Over to you. Thank you very much, sir. Uh, at the outset, I'd like to thank uh, the Ceylon College of Physicians for giving me this opportunity talk to you about how to obtain uh, ethics approval expeditiously. And at the outset, I'd like to make a disclaimer and say that ethics committees are uh, not there to block research, contrary to the popular belief. That's what a lot of people think. But I'd like to say that it's not the case. Uh, the primary function of an ethics review committee is to ensure that the research participants' rights and well-being are protected. And that is how the ethics review committee will be reviewing and doing their work uh, when it comes to research protocols. So what I propose to do is uh, to share some thoughts with you about how you can obtain ethics approval with the minimum hassle. And in to do that, I'll be talking to you, um, okay, on three aspects. How to select an appropriate ethics review committee because that will be very crucial. Uh, what is needed from the applicant and what the ERC will do. And to sum up, I'll just do some do's and do don'ts so that it will be easier for you uh, when it comes to applying for an ERC. So most importantly, plan your study. And that's extremely important because if it's an SR study, you need to consider the time that is available for you because you will need to finish it given a within a particular time frame. And that will have implications because if you time it very tightly, uh, there will be issues with the ethics review committee's review. There will be eth reviews um, issues if you need to apply to the clinical trials registry and so on. So it's very important that you plan your study properly and decide on the time frame that is available for you. The next important thing is consider what you really want from the research. Do you really want to go for a good publication? Is it just a curricular requirement that you need to fulfill so that you get your board certification? Whatever it is, that also has an impact on the research that you want to do. So if you really want to go beyond this particular point and advance your research to a great extent, then this is probably the stepping stone because you can plan your study well and then take it forwards after you finish your preliminary studies. So that's important because, again, if you plan very complicated studies, there's going to be issues with uh, timing and uh, so on. So it's important that you select your research topic very carefully. And I think uh, in the morning, Prof. Janaka spoke to you all about how to select your research. And later on in the day, Prof. Lekha Masam will be talking to you about what the PGM expects from your research. So it's important to remember that if you select complicated research topics or clinical trials, they're going to be more difficult than simple audits and some observational studies. So obviously then there would be more ethical issues that need to be addressed when you submit the application. So preparing the application is also extremely important. You need to make sure that you have everything right. And one of the problems that we see 
when we get applications is that they are badly prepared. So the moment it is badly prepared, the ERC will not even look at it. They will just send it back saying, please make sure that you have everything that is needed. So it's very important to check what the ERC wants. And it's easy now because we have come to a consensus among the ERCs in the country, which came actually from one of the one of a, another workshop like this we did with the SRs, where they said, can't you all, you know, at least make it uniform. And that's what we have done. So all the ERCs will have similar things uh, for their application process. So need to check what the application wants. And as of now, we have a generic application form which all of us in the ERCs across the island use. Of course, there are certain other extra things that each particular ERC will be asking. So you need to look at what that application wants and see that it is filled in the appropriate way. Very important to answer the questions that are there because if there are empty cages, obviously again, it'll get back to you. Uh, if it's a postgraduate study, we need the border study approval letter. Otherwise the ERC will not process beyond that point. A detailed protocol. And Prof. Padmesaran talked to you all about how uh, various study methodologies need to be looked at. And that's extremely important. The ERC wants a full protocol. Uh, in addition to that, they will want the informed consent forms, all the translations in Sinhala and Tamil, the research tools, the questionnaires, whatever you're going to use, uh, and their translations as well. So that complete application package should come to the ERC. Uh, and it's important that the documents are properly prepared and well prepared. Um, so we see a lot of cut paste coming in where you've taken something from somebody else's study and it's totally irrelevant and there is no flow. So the moment that happens, it gets blocked there. Uh, the next important thing is you need to check the limits of the ethics review committee's oversight. Because if you're planning, for example, if you're planning a clinical trial in Sri Lanka, there are only few ethics review committees that can give you approval for a clinical trial. So if you want to do that, you need to go for an ethics review committee like that. The second issue is whether the ethics approval you get from one ethics review committee will be respected by the institutions where you're going to do your study. So will the ERC say at Jayawardhanapura or SLMA approval be accepted by the hospitals that you're going to do your study is also equally important. Now ERCs do have certain understandings among themselves. Uh, so there are certain hospitals which will say, okay, if you have your ethics approval from this particular ERC, we are happy to take it. There will be no review at that point. So that will cut down on your time. So again, you'll get it quickly. On the other hand, some would say, no, that's fine. You have one ethics approval, but it needs to go through our ethics review committee as well. And that ERC might say, right, they've got it from a bigger ERC. There are recognized ERCs in the country. So from one of them, let's look to see whether there are any administrative issues that will take place in our hospital if they do these studies. And by doing that, they will just look at it without going through the methodology. But whatever it is, it's very important for the researchers to find out the oversight, the limit of oversight that the ERC has and whether that is okay for the study that you're planning, because otherwise you will have to submit it again to another ERC and go through the whole process of a review, which is going to take time. So in the protocol, check the title and make sure that it is compatible with the general and specific objectives. You need to ensure that there is adequate justification for doing the study. This is very important when it comes to me too studies, uh, like for example, studies which say, I want to look at the clinical features of dengue patients admitted to a particular unit. Now the question then is, how would the patients who are admitted to that particular unit differ from the other patients who have dengue? So if you want to do a me too study or which is not going to really give you much data, you need to justify very strongly as to why you're doing that study. The methodology is extremely important. Prof. Padmesaran highlighted a lot of aspects. So in the methodology, the study population, what you have selected, the sample size, the detailed method of how you are going to do whatever you want to do needs to be stated. What we find sometimes is that when you have different objectives and in some instances, they need different sample size calculations. 
and that has not been done. And you apply just one sample size calculation to the entire project. And therefore, then when you look at it, okay, you can't meet those objectives in that particular way. So you need to bear that in mind when you plan your study. Um, and in the protocol, make sure you address all the ethical issues that might arise from that study. Now, one of the common statements we get in practically 80% of the protocols that are submitted to ERC is, is that under ethical issues, it just says ethics approval will be obtained from ethics review committee of whatever place. Now, that's not ethical issues. Ethical issues are basically categorized under the benefits for the participants, which is known as beneficence, uh, the harms that they might encounter, and then how you mitigate those harms, that is non-maleficence. Very importantly, autonomy, how do you protect their rights? Um, how can they decide on whether they want to take part in the study or not? And justice, which is uh, taking every, giving everybody an equal chance of getting into a study without overburdening other people. For example, sometimes we find that the same group of people are getting exposed to research um, repeatedly. For example, these days you'll find that patients who are going to the IDH might get more exposed to all COVID related studies. So therefore, there is a possibility that some people will be exposed more. Similarly, we find that some people are excluded simply for convenience. Like for example, because I can't speak in Tamil, I would exclude Tamil speaking people in my study. Now it's not justice because justice means that both the risks and the benefits should be equally distributed and everybody should have an equal chance of getting into it. So conveniently excluding a particular group is not acceptable. And if you are excluding that group, you will have to have a very strong justification to say why you're not taking Tamil speaking people or Sinhala speaking people. For in some areas, it is possible because there wouldn't be uh, Sinhala speaking people or Tamil speaking people. And that's fine if you can give us scientific data to the ethics review committee to say, my area doesn't have uh, Tamil speaking or Sinhala speaking people. Then the most important thing is the vulnerability in the study population that you take. Now, traditionally, uh, people used to think that if you are a child, you are vulnerable. If you are a woman, you are vulnerable, and so on. But it's changing now, and the vulnerability will depend on the situation. So depending on that situation that you're looking at, uh, you will have to decide whether your patients are vulnerable or your study participants are vulnerable, and how are you going to mitigate those vulnerable issues that might come in the protocol. So it's extremely important that in the protocol, these issues are addressed by the reviewer because otherwise the ethics review committee is going to look at all these things. And if they are not addressed, the project, uh, the project will get back to you to address all these issues. So it's very important at the beginning, if you can look at those, address those issues one by one and tell the ethics review committee, look, these are the issues I feel. I see this is how I'm going to mitigate it. And then it's easy for you and the ethics review committee to go on to that dialogue later on. So when it comes to the ethics review committee, it will be a full board review. There will be no special privileges or exemptions simply because it's a, a postgraduate research. So I would say plan to give at least at least three months for the ethics review committee review, because if you apply it this month, it will go to the next board meeting. And then the comments will come to you. If you address all those comments satisfactorily, it will get approved the next month. So that is a minimum of three months. Um, having been on these boards, I would say it will take a little bit longer than that, unless the protocol is properly planned and everything is in place. Then, of course, it can be within two months, but give it time. Uh, so, as I said, the quality of the documents would be very important. And how quickly you, as the PI, responds to the ERC. Because if you take a long time, then if it doesn't coincide with the next meeting date, and when you send your reply, it's going to take another one month to go there. So it's important that you comply with the dates that are given by the ERCs. And importantly, um, PIs don't have to do exactly uh, or everything that the ERCs ask. That's not necessary. And if you can justify and tell the ERC, no, I don't agree with you for these reasons, ERCs are reasonable people and they will also understand that uh, this is why uh, you all are saying it. So it's important for you to justify if you do not want to do what the ERC wants. Uh, and keeping in mind that uh, ERC is just, again, I'm stressing the fact that they're looking at 
the participants view and the participants safety more than anything else. So as I mentioned earlier, the ERC will be looking at the justification for the study and the methodology, which is the scientific validity and the social value of that research. Now you will ask me then if the border study has approved the study, why should the ERC look at the scientific validity? That is because sometimes even though it has undergone a review process, the ethics review committee will find certain issues that might compromise the scientific validity. And as Prof. Admeser and rightly said just a few minutes ago, if you don't get valid data, that research study would be useless. And for the ERC's perspective, if the study is not scientifically valid and it has no social value, it is unethical for a study to be uh, allowed to continue. So that is why the ERC is looking at these aspects also. Then apart from that, as I mentioned earlier, they will be looking at the ethical issues for participant protection and mainly for autonomy, the informed consent forms, the information that you are giving, who's receiving it, is it in a language that they can understand, are you telling them everything that is necessary to be told, can they give consent, and is it a voluntary, uncoerced type of a consent that the person is giving. So to summarize, what are the do's? submit complete documents. I can't stress this enough because every single time we send it back at the time of submission, that is because the documents are incomplete. So don't assume that the ERC will do corrections. That's not the ERC's job. They're not doing corrections. So see that your documents are complete. Ensure that your application is complete. Everything that they want. If you need to do talk to the ERC. There is absolutely nothing to stop you from contacting the ERC or the ERC's chairperson or secretary or whoever they have got on their websites if you need some information or if you need some clarifications. That will minimize a lot of delays because they'll be able to help you with uh, whatever that they need to do. And of course, stick to deadlines. If there are submission deadlines, make sure that you meet them so that they'll go to the next available meeting. As for the don'ts, uh, don't assume anything. Yes, now, for instance, um, I think Prof. Padme has mentioned if you're taking COVID patients, who exactly constitute a COVID patient? And that definition has to be there in the protocol. Correct. We get a lot of people, where, uh, applications where they say people with diabetes. So, right, we know what diabetes is, but it needs to be specified because it's a research protocol. What exactly do you mean? by your diabetic patient, are they patients who are naive and therefore you're going by blood reports or are they patients who are already diagnosed and they are on medicines? Whatever it is, do tell us because don't assume that we know everything and if it is not there, we don't know what you want us to do. And from the ERC's perspective, if it's not written, it is not known and it will not be done. So therefore it means that it will be rejected. It won't be rejected, but it will come back to you. So my final take home message is plan well, give the ERC's time. You'll be, it'd be good if you can end up with just minor corrections, which means your time will be very minimal. Uh, and by doing all those things, you can get your research protocol approved very expeditiously um, with the, uh, from an ERC. Thank you. Thank you, Chandani. Uh, excellent. You know, I mean, uh... She really showed that uh, good ethics is good science, you know, that's what she said. And uh, just, uh, you know, just for the audience, uh, they have question time. And if you want, and if you want to ask any questions, please type it and uh, send it through your link to the chat box uh, till the questions come. Question, Janaka, do you want to listen? Yeah, there is a question, Chandani. Uh, can you, uh, well, what is the exact role of a clinical trials registry? Because there are some registries supposed to be kind of, even after ethics approval, uh, they are seeking approval of the scientific content. Okay, sir. Um, the uh, clinical trials registry's job is to make sure that when you do a trial, that information is publicly available. So if somebody wants to know whether there is a trial being done uh, on a particular topic, then the clinical trials registry is the place to go because they will have the methodology, uh, the recruitment criteria, the objectives and the outcomes and so on specified in their website. Uh, 
I have been in a clinical trial statistic for a while, but um, generally the mandate does not include asking for any scientific corrections because we assume that that has been looked at by the ethics review committee. But having said that, if there are issues and then they can't, you know, uh, put it in properly according to the format that is there in the uh, in their website, they would probably ask the uh, applicant to correct it. What really happens is we have these parallel submissions and the person would probably submit the original application they sent to the ERC and upload the same data to the clinical trials registry. So the approved protocol then is different. And when we actually ask the PI to clarify certain issues from the clinical trial registry's point of view, it is to see that they have just been addressed by the ethics review committee's things and it's just that it doesn't come to the uh, clinical trials registry website. So that's where the conflict rises. So if the PIs can make sure that whatever information that they submit is current as much as possible, uh, then the problems are less. What, uh, what would you do with poorly designed studies like um, methods are pretty bad? We try very I mean, hard not to. is well, they are not there to look at our method, they are only there to look at ethics. How okay, so if it? it's extremely bad, we what we do is uh, we generally try and have a dialogue with extremely the... Extremely bad, only. No, no. <laughs> the, method, <laughs> the methodology is generally needs correction and uh, Padme should probably know that, you know. Uh, I think it's just that you don't look at it in detail when you submit. It's not that they haven't thought about it. It's just that they think, oh, let me submit anything and try and get an approval. But no, what we do is we have a way of looking at it. We either approve outright or we reject outright or we go for either minor or major modifications. So depending on the, uh, the mistakes or the issues that they have, it might end up with a minor or major modifications. Rejections would be like, you know, totally unsalvageable and ethically unacceptable studies. Like you sometimes get clinical trials, which are just one A4 sheet. So that type of thing would get rejected outright, but otherwise uh, there would be a dialogue and it's very rarely that a trial uh, protocol would get rejected from an ethics oh, review committee. So doing a badly designed study, then that is also a waste of time, wasting resources, all that. So isn't it unethical? To it is, so we won't accept it unless the methodology is corrected. That's why the dialogue goes on and on, sometimes a month until we come to a consensus and say, okay, fine, we are okay and they are okay. And then we approve, but it will not get approved otherwise. Sir. Okay, there are no other questions. No, no questions. Okay, thank you, Chandani. Thank you very much. On behalf of the College of Physicians, I would like to give you a token of appreciation. Thank you. Thank you. Yes,
the conclusions in your paper is meant to suggest how your work has advanced the field, how your research can apply to the field at the current state and how you plan to move forward and what is the next step you are going to take. And in the conclusions, do not downplay your negative results. Make statements based on personal opinion without scientific support. Do not repeat sections which we have already said in the discussion or do not over glamorize your research. Coming to the introduction, introduction is essentially where you provide context to your work. The introduction should be just three paragraphs. The three paragraphs, the first one gives you context to the work. Second paragraphs creates a knowledge gap. And the third paragraph tells the reader, therefore, this is what I'm going to do. For example, you say, hemoglobin E beta thalassemia is so common in the world. That's the first paragraph. Second paragraph is, however, E beta thalassemia, we don't know this and that. And the third paragraph, we say, therefore, this is what we plan to do. Now, in the introduction, do not try to make it into a history lesson. Do not have a large amount of references. Keep the references to a minimum. And if you have review articles, use reviews instead of single references. And do not ignore contradictory studies. Abstract. Abstract has three purposes. While you are writing the abstract, it helps you to synthesize what you have done. For once you submit to the editor, it allows you, the editor, to decide whether this is worthwhile to send to peer review. If it is published, the abstract is what makes people decide whether this article is worth reading. Abstract is the major seller of your paper. An ab a good abstract should be precise, honest, standalone, brief, specific, no technical jargon, and no references. The abstract, again, is the main business point. Then finally, you decide to give a name to your work. Here, when you decide on the name, you have to, the name should convey the main findings of the research. Be specific, be concise, be complete, but be attractive. Do not be ambiguous, do not give unnecessary details, and do not use abbreviations. A good title would contain the fewest possible words that adequately describes the contents of the paper, and it should be specific. For example, if you do a study on antibacteria uh, streptomycin on tuberculosis, and you have found that it has very good inhibitory activity, one very good way of giving a title is to describe what you have found. Inhibition of growth of mycobacterium TB by streptomycin. In a sense, that is what you found. That's the title. The worst possible title is to be vague by saying action of antibiotics of bacteria. So these are the two extreme examples of a good and a bad title. So once you've done all that, you have to give keywords. This is essentially for indexing. Three to six keywords may be needed, depending on the journal. And then you have to decide on referencing style. Again, it depends on the instructions to authors. Harvard system, Vancouver, or the APA system may be requested. Follow the instructions to authors. If you have generated so much of work, but the journal wants only two tables and two figures, but you have so much to give, you can give that data as supplementary material. The journal is not going to publish that in a printed form, but will allow it to be given online. Finally, for a writer, 
There are three C's to remember. Be clear, be precise, concise, and be correct. The enemies of a writer would be repetition, redundancy, old hat, writing old stuff, which is of no help, no interest to anybody, ambiguity, being vague, exaggeration. Once all that is done, you have to decide on the authors. Do not give authorship to your girlfriend or your wife, not just because your boss was there and knew nothing about it, don't give authorship to your boss. There are criteria laid by, by journals, follow that. Know whom to acknowledge. And of course, very importantly, ethical clearance, you have to uh, pay great attention to that. Without ethical clearance, nothing can be done these days. Then there is the process, whole complicated process of submission. But most importantly, you should have a big heart to accept rejection. Uh, remember, rejection of a paper is not end of life. Now, when you submit, quality of a winner, an article which is accepted, which editors love would be original articles, originality, stuff which advances the field, which is readable and ethical studies. Studies which have been done before where there is no scientific interest, out of date stuff, incomplete studies, where there is insufficient data are basically losers. So once done before you write or after writing before submission, look back and plan out before you write and write in the proper order, have good language, write a good cover letter, Check, make sure that you've done it properly, discuss with your peers, revise your paper over and over again, have a big heart to accept rejection even if it is rejected, but most importantly, behave in an ethical way. Thank you very much. Yeah. Thank you, Anuja, for that uh, very clear exposition of how to write a paper. And uh, I think uh, it's time to ask a question from Prof. Premavardhana. So if there's any questions to ask him, please write, type, and send it to your link. So uh, really get questions, I would like to hand over Prof. Premavardhana. Uh, a token of appreciation on behalf of the College of Physicians for your contribution. Thank you. Can I ask you something? Excellent talk. Uh, now, you were talking about the authorship, and I think there are guidelines on authorship. But recent, I mean, recently I saw, but I think it's happening. There's a paper, I think in Nature, 584 authors. Now, what do you think about that? I think it all depends on, you know, if uh, can they have contributed. 584 people write a paper, can they kind of, how, what kind of responsibility do they, can they take for a study or? Or is it justified in including all people who collaborate and who contributed a patient as author in a study? I suppose the number depends on uh, what the role, authorship depends on the role. If it is, uh, they have contributed, for example, complex genetic work uh, or clinical work for that matter, and say, let's say it's a clinical trials where uh, multi-center clinical trials and uh, you you get that kind of uh, very large number of uh, authors um, and I, I don't see a problem though you, you uh, 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 would look such numbers in uh, amazement 
I don't think there is a problem with large number of people in uh, in journals being authors, but the problem is uh, not large number, but you know, even smaller number of people who don't contribute. But as long as they, I have done the, you know, st stuck uh, to the strict criteria that they have been asked to do. That's fine, but it all depends on what goes uh, inside the closed doors in those uh, offices. There's a question from Dr. Pasindu Fernando. He says, can a case report series be regarded as a publication? Yes, of course. So it, as publication is, it, it all depends on, I suppose what your question uh, might be, uh, it is definitely a publication without a doubt. I suppose this is a, kind of question uh, more directed at the PGIM yeah. boss than anybody else, I think. <laughs> <laughs> That's probably the answer. Uh, the answer is yes, of course, yes. And uh, somebody else is asking, can I have a soft copy of the presentation? But I think it's available online after it's, you know, once sessions is over, you can access it through the website. So I think you don't need to uh, soft copy. You can access it on, on the, on the College of Physicians web. No other questions, no? Yeah. Okay. Thank you, Anuja. Thank, Thank you very much. Yeah, we are ready for the next talk, and that is by Professor Seneca Rajapaksa, who's the director, current director of the Postgraduate Institute of Medicine, University of Colombo, with an extensive research profile. And he will be speaking on how to get your paper published. Thank you, sir. First of all, my special thanks to the President and the College of Physicians for inviting me. I think this has become an annual event to have this session on research. It's particularly focused on the postgraduate trainees, but of course it's open to everybody else. So there's a lot of overlap between what Anuja talked about and what I'm going to speak. So we'll have to, repetition is always a good thing in any case. Um, but the focus is really on how to get your paper published rather than how to write your paper. At this point, you have already written your paper and you are now trying to modify it and deal with these uh, rather strange creatures who are known as editors and reviewers. I'm the editor of the CMJ also, uh, uh, and try to negotiate with them to get your paper published. So the best thing you need, the most important thing you need to get your paper published is good quality research. If your work is good, then there's a high chance of it getting published. If it is not so good, then it's more difficult. Uh, and uh, the problem with most of the research that is done, particularly by the postgraduate trainees in this country, is that only about 17% or 20% gets uh, something in that range, gets actually published. Most of it ends up as a dissertation or a book bound book somewhere in a, uh, in a library somewhere. So that's unsatisfactory because publications are important to enhance the uh, profile of the country in terms of research. So you need good quality research, but you also need to present it properly. And that is what this talk is all about. So if you're trying to sell a car, it's not just the looks that matter. Not, it's just, not just having it nice and polished, but it also has to be reliable, have a solid go, work well, and be usable. So the same principle applies when you want to publish a paper. You're trying to sell your work to make it to the scientific community and make it accepted. So uh, a little bit of overlap here. Before you start your writing and preparing your manuscript, you need to be thorough about your work. You need to study, be familiar with what you've done, understand why you did the study, make sure that what you did, the results, meet the original objectives, make sure that the conclusions are based on your own findings. We often talk about some tiny little finding and then make conclusions which are so broad that uh, it, it does, just doesn't match. Uh, and to identify what the most important message arising from your findings are. So if you have got those points right, then you are set and ready 
to start writing your paper and selling it to the editor. So I'm looking at it from a perspective of selling your work to the editor and the reviewers of a journal and not so much focusing on the actual nitty gritty of writing, which Anuja has covered very nicely. So uh, a paper is a story. It should have a beginning, a middle and an end. And an interesting story which flows from one to another is readable, accessible, and impresses the reader who is either the editor at the first point and ultimately the, the, the readership of the journal. So who wants to read something boring? You want to read something which has a nice linear flow and which tells you like a story so that you can understand what is being said without having to stress your brain too much. So when you start writing the background of today, I just thought I'll cover this, you need to answer some of these questions. What is known on the subject? Why was this study done? What's the gap in knowledge that you're trying to fill? Why is this study different from others? Why are the findings from your study important? And whom are they relevant to? What discipline? What kind of researcher? And where in the world would the person who is reading this article find it relevant and important? Uh, research which is of no interest to the larger readership is less likely to get published. But sometimes certain articles have to do cater to a very minority of the audience. It's important to strike that balance. So when you plan to publish your study, you need to identify the target group who will be interested and attract their interest. Um, these are some general tips which I practice and find useful. First, take your results, examine them and pick out what is interesting. Leave out what is not interesting and what is not relevant. A good practice is to just sit down with a blank sheet of paper and write down in simple English what the key points of your study are, the methodology bit, the findings and what you're going to talk about and try to pull out from your data something which is exciting and interesting and something which is new. Use to start with single sentences, don't worry about grammar and structure at this stage and then move things around to sort of create a nice linear flow. Look at it from the reader's point of view. If I read this article, would I find it interesting? If I'm a reader, how would I expect it to be more interesting? How would I, what sort of changes would make it more interesting to me? And also don't forget at the end of the day to write down your limitations and shortcomings. So this is a general overview of how you approach the, the presentation of the facts that you have found. Your paper should be as concise and as structured as possible. There is no advantage in using big words and high flown language. You can say that the majority of the majority of the population in our study who was in the geriatric age group were of the male gender, or you can say that all particip more particip the majority of participants were men. So make it simple because no one is interested in trying to decipher a long convoluted sentence. Short sentences saying one thing at a time. And if you have to say two things, why not make it into two sentences? Remember that paragraphs of single sentences are grammatically incorrect and you must have uh, at least a couple of sentences for a, to make, make out a paragraph. Get your grammar and spelling right. There's nothing more irritating from an editor's point of view than to see someone sending a paper which is so badly written. The grammar has not been looked at. The spelling has not been looked at. In the old days, when we used to type these out, it would have been acceptable Type on a typewriter. But there are spell checks in every word processor. And there is the internet which can spell for you and even get your grammar right. So there is no excuse. It's just being slipshod if you do that. And sometimes people do that hoping that the editor is going to do their work for them and that is really not going to happen. Pay attention to detail because every little detail counts. It's that precision and that fine attention to detail which is likely to make your paper stand above the other papers that the editor receives. Because remember, an editor receives a lot of very poor quality papers. And when you come across something well written, there is a tendency for the editor or the reviewers to say, this stands out from the others. And one thing is to read, reread, read again, go on reading the paper many, many times, making it as perfect as you can. 
Sometimes I find after doing all that, when the proofs come, you find that you have missed a letter somewhere. So there is, it's worth spending time to, to pay that attention to perfection. So perfection produces an impressive manuscript, which then the reader, the author, the editor, and the reviewers will find interesting and impressive. Uh, publication ethics, do not plagiarize, not even yourself. That is very important. Most journals run a plagiarism checker. And if you are looking at it from the PGIM trainee's point of view, the PGIM now runs a plagiarism check and we reject documents which have been plagiarized more than 20%. There are lots of free versions. The PGIM has a licensed version which is accessible to all. Uh, so don't make sure there is no plagiarism. Never submit to two journals at once. Some people do that. They send it to two or three journals, hoping that one will publish. The trouble is if both accept it, you are in a real mess because then it goes as a duplicate publication. And we had an instance once where a paper which was published in the PGM journal was also published in the C submitted to the CMG, which was already published. And both had to retract, both retracted. The CMG didn't accept it. And the PGM journal retracted the paper. Also, remember to cite and acknowledge similar papers, including your own work. Uh, and authorship, list all authors who contributed. There are criteria, the ICMJE uh, criteria, International Committee of Medical Journal Editors has laid down criteria who qualifies for authorship. And as Anuj said, it's very important not to list authors who don't fulfill the criteria. It is much better to list all the authors, even if there are 500, if they have contributed, than to just list someone who is a head of department or your relative or your friend, just because you feel obliged to grant him authorship. It is an insult to those who have actually contributed to the study if you list people who have not qualified for authorship. So picking the right journal is not an easy task for medical people, the easiest is PubMed because most, almost all index journals are also indexed on PubMed. By indexing, you mean classically the science citation index, but the Pub, PubMed has all, more, all journals are indexed in the science citation index. Uh, so look at PubMed and look for people who have published journals which are similar to yours. Uh, if you are looking for a narrow topic, a very fine topic, then you go for a specialist journal Look at other authors who have written similar papers. You will know them because the people in this country who work on these things, you, we generally know who is writing papers in the same area. Study their work, emulate them, see what questions they have answered and what questions they have not answered and pick up on those and try to answer those questions. Go to journals which have published similar papers and look at the readership of those journals when you're picking a journal to publish. Look for high impact factor journals, which are indexed on PubMed, Science Citation Index and Scopus, and avoid predatory journals like the plague. They just want your money. Now a predatory journal is difficult to pick out if you are a novice, but if you are an experienced author, it is where the moment you see the journal, you know it's predatory. Some predatory journals are cheap also. You, for about $20, you can get your paper published. There is a thing called Beals List which uh, list the journals which are predatory. But usually you can see respected sir and madam, um, we would be delighted to accept your paper publication guaranteed within 24 hours. And then of course you, the second email when you submit it comes that you have to pay them a thousand dollars to get it published. It is a disgrace scientifically to publish in a predatory journal and worse you run the risk of getting blacklisted by the decent journals and in universities, you get into a lot of trouble if you have published in a predatory journal. It kind of erases all the good work that you have done. But don't confuse predatory journals with online journals. There are many, many good quality online journals like the BMC group, the PLOS group, which are online only. And I think in the future, most journals will be online only. The days of paper journal is gone. It's going and soon they will all die. Publication fees are another contentious issue. So many of the better journals are now charging a fee. They do so for one particular reason. They do so because 
they provide open access to all people. So it has to be funded to become open access. Many, many journals give you a waiver for middle, low middle income countries and middle income countries. We have sort of wavered between low and high. And I think now we are again on the low middle income category. So we have a better chance. But even if they don't uh, give you an exemption, make a sub story. We are poor, we have no money, we get a salary of so much. How can we afford this kind of thing? And generally the authors will give you some kind of a waiver. Most universities uh, fund some amount of publication fees. The National Science Foundation does some funding. But remember that some of the best journals are still free. It's difficult to get into them because they are high quality journals. Always follow the guide for authors and don't assume that the editor is going to format the journal for you. Pay attention to detail, check your fonts, your uh, sizes, your paragraphs, number your pages, and remember to add the extra bits, the acknowledgement section, the conflict of interest statements, author contributions, get those all clear and don't leave them assuming that the editor is going to do it for you. For references, I always use a reference manager. EndNote is a commercial one. Mendeley is free and it allows you to reformat your references at the click of a button. Always follow the journal's reference format and don't miss out key seminal references, references which have been the main reference for the subject. And also don't deliberately leave out key references because they might dilute your work. Sometimes there is another paper which is similar and you leave out the reference thinking that, you know, that will dilute your work. You shouldn't do that, cite it because your, the point is that your paper must be sufficiently different from the original reference. Anyway, the reviewer is an expert in the subject and he will eventually get to know that you have tried to hide something. So pictures are good. It's worth a thousand words, but don't use them uh, inappropriately. Use them to illustrate your results, format them, use titles, tables, figures appropriately, uh, but don't duplicate results which can be written in text by putting up a picture just for the sake of having a picture. So pictures must be appropriate and must add to the value of the manuscript. Sorry, this, uh... So at the end, go through a checklist. Do your findings advance knowledge in the specified field? Is your work of interest to the journal's audience? Is your manuscript structured properly? Are your conclusions justified by your results? Are your references international and accessible enough? Did you format your figures? Did you correct all the grammatical and spelling mistakes? Make sure that these are all done before you submit. Choose your reviewers widely, wisely. Very often, most journals will ask you to suggest some reviewers. Now, it is a good thing to you choose the more the experts in the field. The higher the caliber of the reviewer, the more likely that you will get a fair review. Even if you get rejected, you will learn something from that person's review and you'll be able to embellish your next manuscript better with the findings that, with, the, with what you have learned. <laughs> Try to avoid reviewers who have a conflict of interest and if you have a competing team, you may name them and say, I don't want so-and-so to review my paper because he will he is likely to have a conflict of interest with my findings and he might give me a negative review. And most journals allow you to do that. It is important to write a very polite cover letter to the editor. Why is this paper important? Why should the journal publish it? What is new? And state the con author's contributions and that there are no conflicts of interest. Now, you meet all kinds of reviewers when you publish a lot of papers, you find that there are different types. So there are bad review editors in, uh, sorry, editors. And this is a thing which was written up, written up by a famous editor uh, who defined the genus editorius and said that there are different types. So the top editor is a returning officer right at the top. He's a person who doesn't know anything. He just gets the, uh, the manuscript. He sends it to the reviewer. He gets it back. He sends it back to the author. He gets it back from the author and he sends it back to the reviewer and he just, he's a returning officer. Then there are, among other people, there is a sloth who is a, I won't go through all of these, but the sloth is a lazy chap who just takes such a long time to review a paper that you get sick of it and you end up submitting it to somebody else. 
then there is the deity who is God, and he, the, you have to pander to his every wish if you want the paper published. And the good ones are there, like the obsessive editors who go through every little detail and sometimes write your paper for you. And then the paragon who is the perfect editor who wants perfection. So understand your editor, when you communicate with your editor, you will realize what sort of a person he is. Very often, if you are lucky and your work is good, you don't get an automatic acceptance, but you get a letter back saying it's not acceptable in its current form, but we would like you to revise it. Don't be disheartened. Sometimes it's horrible. There is a horrible list of things to be correct corrected and then you wonder, I don't think I can ever do this. But if you read it carefully, you will find that it is possible to address. And remember that even if the points may look silly, they are usually valuable because they are given to you by an expert. And think of a way to respond to each point. Itemize the comments and criticism and suggestions. Consider every suggestion carefully. Go back to the drawing board if necessary and try to correct your manuscript in accordance with they have what they have said. And of course, make a nice clean document with the changes tracked and write another document addressing each of the concerns raised by the editors. Remember that sometimes certain editors and reviewers are just plain stupid or just plain nasty. And then their revision just cannot be addressed. So then you have to walk away. But most of the time, you can respond to the comments. And sometimes the reviewer is wrong. And then if you clarify it and explain to him why it is not correct, he will generally come down and agree with your point of view. So be very polite. Thank the, edit, the reviewers. Give an overview of the changes. Respond in detail to every single point And mention where in the manuscript you have addressed your, your changes and made your changes. So. Uh, accept all blame, don't argue with reviewers and tell them that they are wrong and you are right. If you, if they have missed out a point, just point it out and say, I have actually talked about this. And with a little luck, if you address all the points, you will have your paper sewn in print. Uh, sometimes reviewers comments are contradictory and maybe even wrong in such situations. You might find that you realize that there's a conflict of interest between the reviewers and then you just write politely to the editor and say, uh, this is wrong, I don't think this is right and the editor will most of the time understand. So if rejected, don't be dejected, look for a suitable journal, re-examine the scope of the journals and think whether your initial choice is appropriate. Almost all papers, if the material is good, can eventually be published. So don't lose heart, just try and try again. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Senegar. That's a really practical points of how to get your publish, uh, paper published. Uh, it be very useful to our readers. And again, I want to remind you that if you have any questions from Prof. Senegar Rajapaksa, you can type it in your, type it and send it through the link. And uh, meanwhile, Hold on, there's a question, I think. Uh, I think the last, this one before the last is really for Padme Swaran. Yeah, that's right. Hmm. Samchit Tampereira, if the journal insists on a submission fee, are there any organization in our, con in our context that provides funding for research publication? Yes, the NSF does provide some, pub from some uh, payment for the publication, at least they used to. Uh, so one has to write to them, particularly if it's an index journal, there is a good possibility that they'll be able to fund it. And the universities do, if you belong to a university, they will fund. There is a research fund which will pay up to about $300 per submission. That's the rate for the universities and I think the NSF also pays something between $300 and $500 US dollars. Those are the main funding agencies. But the important thing is when you submit your grant application for research to budget the publication fee so that you'll have some money to publish in the end. Okay, I think there are implications come. Anyway, I, I just want to thank uh, Dr. Rajapaksa on behalf of, there's another question, I think. Uh, again, from Dr. Pasindu Fernando is of course. Uh, <laughs> 
Well, so ask, ask background, again, the research allowance for medical could officers. Could you enlighten us on the research allowance for medical officers? I think the research allowance for medical officers was created to enable the medical officers to earn a little bit of extra money for doing some research. So that's the thing. It is supposed to be used for research. So people don't always use it for research, but in universities, your uh, research allowance is dependent on writing, sending up a publication. I don't think that's in the Ministry of Health there is anything like that. Is there? No, no, they pay, but do they yeah. expect you to prove? Um, yes. Yes, that's the thing. So it's not linked to publications, but you have to have a research proposal. Uh, but uh, most people, of course, don't really publish. But the idea is to encourage people to try to publish, because once you, as Anuja said, once you get uh, the taste of blood after publishing a couple of papers, you want more of it. And then you really enjoy writing and getting the, the thrill of having your, seeing your name in print in a good journal is a major thrill. OK, thank you, Sianaka. Thank you, sir. Uh, on behalf of the College of Fusion, I would like you to hand over the uh, you know, certificate of appreciation. So the next speaker is Professor Sarat Lekamasan. He's the professor of med he's the Yeah, he's a professor of medicine at um, Faculty of Medicine Harapiti University of Rohana, and he's currently the Chairman of the Board of Study in Medicine at the PJM. He will speak online on what the PJM wants from your research project. First of all, um, let me thank the Ceylon College of Physicians uh, for giving me this opportunity to uh, speak on this particular project, particular subject. Um, being the last speaker of the, um, the series of series of lectures, and uh, also, uh, since I'm recording this, this lecture, um, there's no way to get to know that, you know, what other people had, would, would, would have spoken in the previous lecture. So there can be a certain amount of overlap with my presentation. So I certainly apologize for that. The um, organizers has very kindly allocated this particular topic, say, what is the PGI wants from your research project? And probably they forgot that actually I'm only the chairman of the Board of Study Medicine. And then um, whatever I speak subsequently in this lecture uh, would be applicable only for those in uh, medicine, MD medicine uh, training program, and, uh, and not and cannot be generalized to the uh, rest of the PGIM uh, training programs. Now, um, if I say what the, the Board of Medicine, um, study medicine expect from the training uh, trainees in the medicine with, with regard to the research project, and it is actually a minor component of board certification. Um, and also it happens uh, during the start training period. So the, uh, the people who plan this curriculum have made sure that the um, uh, that it kept away from the MD stress. So you don't have that much of MD stress, you know, once you finish that only you get into a research project. So you are fairly free mentally uh, to carry out all your research. And also you got a one year to complete it. Uh, but having said that, you know, all these, let's say positive factors, but it is the major reason for delaying and applying for board certification. And during the last two years, what I have observed is that and many people delay their board certification simply because they are not carried out their research project. Now, if you look at the MD Prospectus 2016, there's the uh, newer version. And uh, what actually learning objectives is that the, it is explain the basic steps involved in the clinical research audit. And uh, then also say that the trainee should be able to plan and complete a clinical research and uh, with due appreciation the need of scientific validity, the ethical principles, 
and um, the financial constraints and all. So basically what they are looking at is that for the people to know the steps in, a, in, a, in, a, in planning a research. And also finally effectively communicate the finding of technical research with the with the profession so that you know how you effectively communicate and then you know not not going to the papers or some newspapers or something like that you know how you communicate that effectively with the with the rest of the people in a profession now the second one um, i picked up from the prospectus is, is is actually more important that is the project should be a clinical question or be clinical relevant so that in indirectly saying that you need not get involved with a very kind of advanced molecular biology and nanotechnology research of that nature and it has to be in the area which is clinical relevant as relevant for the clinician or it should be or have some kind of social value and uh, to indicate that you know what should be the area of research now if I summarize all that, what I have said so far, this is a clinical question or something clinical relevant area, and now should have a social value. Now, important thing is also to know that it's a researchable topic. There are topics that you know that certainly you would like to do, but again, you know, you know that it cannot be accomplished through a research, and certainly what you you are um, at the time would not allow you to do that. Uh, and also, it has to be financially viable because there's not much of finances in the way of for a SR to do research, and. Um, I know there are professional organizations like the CCP and uh, the local uh, professional organizations, they also sort of, you know, dole out a certain amount of money. But again, um, that may not be all that much for you to do that. So have to have to make sure that your research is not an expensive research. The expectations are you need to know the, what is called the process of conducting a research so that you know the steps so that you perhaps one day you will be able to do one. And also about the proposal writing and also from the from the proposal right into the dissemination of findings so all the steps involved in during that period that you need to know the key component are what are called scientific validity so that it will be valid, valid scientifically and also ethical approval now when you say clinical research that much the uh, the prospectors talk about what are clinical research there are unsolved or unclear areas in patient care in the patient management now, let's say we discharge patients following, uh, following acute coronary syndrome on the fifth day, and can't we discharge patients on the fourth day? And uh, so there are, there are unsolved, unclear areas in patient care, and these are the ones that you need to, need to address in your research. Now, when you, are, when you are working as a clinician, let's say you have done a ward round for one week, at the end of the one week, if you really reflect, and then you will find that, you know, you... There are so many questions that, that remain unanswered during your ward round. Now, you might query what is called the etiology of an illness and what caused this, all this fever and the jaundice and all that, you know, he recovered and all that. I mean, what is actually the etiology of this particular illness? And also, you will question about the variety of an investigation. Let's say you've got one of the sophisticated, sophisticated investigations. And then, is it how, how, how valid is that investigation? You know, to arrive at the diagnosis. You also might have doubts about what is called efficacy of an intervention. Maybe it may be in the form of treatment, maybe in the form of you know intervention in the form of procedure. But then you might question whether it is an effective thing or not. And also prognosis of a condition. And that's all the usual things that you know you have a little of uncertainties. But in the recent past, people have expanded this area to other areas of interest as well. For example, something like patient satisfaction. Now, these are things that we have actually not very much done research on. The quality of life, the patient safety, and the cost analysis, etc. So these are again come within the what is called the clinical relevant researchable topics that you know you must select. So there's a wide variety of the topics that you can select. And uh, out of that, it's up to you to decide which, which one you're going to tackle. Now, the main areas we expect the students to learn is a selecting an area for research, and there's a relevance. Literature search and literature survey is not in a very big way unless it is an MPhil or a PhD project. We don't want a very huge, extensive literature survey, really. And other ones are about the writing objectives, and objectives need to be written, very specific objectives. They need to be specific, need to be clear, and also need to be achievable. We sometimes call it smart, and then that is how the objective should be written. 
the study sample, we want the study sample to be representative of that they, they, they come from and also need to be adequate. So we talk about what's called study population, study sample, and selection criteria like inclusion, inclusion criteria, and sample size. Now, these are the basic steps that you need to know. Now, during the data collection, one need to question what you're going to measure and also when to measure. You're doing a CRP in a patient who, who, who has come with acute coronary syndrome, uh, do you do it immediately after the patient comes, or do you can wait for another three days and take the measurement? Is it valid? And when to collect the sample? I know how to measure. Now, also, there's a question about the validity of measurements, like, you know, whether this is the right method to do that. And then it is valid, the, accurate, the accuracy of the data that you've taken is, is also important now. The data analysis of method of analysis, and we don't insist very much for the people to you know a lot of statistics, but certainly getting the help of a statistician and uh, in, in analysis is always welcome. The ethical approval, the approval of other authorities like institutions, and final report, the component of the report people should know. Now, let's look at the, what are the common mis mistakes that people do. And during the last two years, as I, I told you, the various mistakes that I see people doing. And area of research, they select areas where the information is already available. And then there's no actual, there's no novelty. So that, that information is already available. So again, question why you should do it. And also there are common topics among, this, among the trainees which are very common, like you know, what's called complications of diabetes. And I think this has been done over and over again, and there's no novelty in that. And also people doing what are called CAP studies, the knowledge that use and practices studies. And also it's, it's a, there's a, a very a certain, very restricted area that people are trying to do that. And then, you know, largely un, not applicable for the rest of the, uh, this thing it cannot be generalized and the CKDU, so a lot of research on this. Now, when people write the main objective, what they do is actually they cut and paste the uh, title. So avoid duplication, duplicating the title, and uh, that is not the right to main objective. Main objective should be, should be written, uh, uh, taken from the title, but then you know written it as a different one. The specific objectives, which are of, of course not specific, and also unmeasurable and un unachievable, and uh, at times, so you have to, to point it out saying that well, you're not going to do that within the next, let's say, one year. And also not considering the time available. The representatives of a study sample and uh, people tend to collect data from the case notes, which is not a very good thing. Uh, in particular, in Sri Lanka, where the, where the information is eliciting information is quite inconsistent and over a period of time. And uh, also that uh, there's a lack of uniformity in recording data. Uh, because we don't we don't uh, use uh, type of you know the um, software that the people use to uh, to record uh, information. So then, um, though patient have that particular condition may not have been sort of elicited by by the way of questioning and may not have been recorded. So that is the problem. And also access to patients' records and certain patient records may you may not be able to access and then you know may have got. Uh, loss in the this thing and also may, may not be able to achieve all that. And also we discourage what I call single unit research and some people looking at let's say the, the complications in a patient with diabetes in a single unit and largely is not applicable to let's say another unit in the same, even same hospital. So it's a really a waste of time. And also people have a habit of taking what's called convenient samples. Convenient samples are people taking you know, samples when you know, they have little time and all and also that is not going to give you a representative sample. The case definition, and uh, often we find that people are doing research on, let's say, infection like a dengue or patient infection leptospirosis, but then there's no case definition given, if, even, even for CKD. And uh, so you have to give a clear case definition, which is acceptable, and then saying that these are the cases I'm going to include in, the, in, the, in my research. Now, inclusion, exclusion criteria, when people write exclusion criteria, they actually say the opposite of inclusion criteria. For example, if you say inclusion criteria is the men between 18 to 65 with diabetes, and then the next thing under exclusion, they say women. You don't have that because you said you include only men because it is understood that you're not going to study women, so you're not going to exclude women. 
and those without diabetes and men less than 18 and more than 65 so actually it's opposite of what we have written uh, inclusion and that that's not the way to write that the exclusion has to be let's say if you are taking the men between 18 to 65 with diabetes let's say exclusion may be those with a nephropathy and retinopathy because for some reason you need to exclude those people and maybe that account your objective that you know, you're not going to take people who are on insulin at the moment that depends on what your spe- objectives are and then um, so remember that within that within that study subject like a men between 18 to and 65 and what are the exclusion criteria not outside that pain that you know exactly opposite of the inclusion criteria now there are a lot of controversial exclusion criteria now um, for example people exclude those who do not speak a particular language and i don't think that is the right way to do that because you cut off let's say certain percentage of people immediately and that is again is a little problem and also people say people will exclude people who cannot understand the study protocol so it is your your uh, responsibility to make sure that people can understand the study protocol written in such a way that people should could understand that and uh, and also people say people who can't read and write and they are they may be the most important people to be included in the study and also some people say people who have impaired mobility that we will not include so so these are the little controversial and also certainly going to uh, uh, affect the data that you have collected now in the data collection you need to be aware of the what is called pitfalls in the measurements now are you going to check past in samples or resting or restriction of some food um, that need to be very carefully considered and uh, also whether you're going to take average let's say if you are taking repeated measurements are you going to take average are you going to take a best value they all need to be very clearly mentioned in the research now questionnaire based data uh, we always encourage you to use what is called the already questionnaire that have already been used in other 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 places like in a previous research because they are generally undergone what called validation process but only thing that they may be validated for a western population but then has been validated to a local population so always we ask this question has it been validated for sri lankan population so um, question that have not been validated and that in originally in, in different language and then we discourage people to use them unless they have been validated and if you are developing a new question a brand new question for your this thing and at least you make sure that there's a minimum of what's called content validity that is you have shown that to a, let's say a group of experts in that field and they agree that you know this should be the content in this question so they agree on the content and you're not left out anything important and also you're not included something which is unimportant so at least content validity need to be need to be ensured now this area that you know students very train is very much get get uh, what's called affected and um, the calculation sample size now calculation sample size would depend on what's called study method and uh, what people try to do is actually most of the studies they they develop they give this what's called particular formula and which is actually for the what's called single proportion formula and um, but then when you look at the study method then the study subject of objectives and this is a completely wrong formula that they are using and uh, for the convenience what they say is that you know this information is not available about this particular particular area and then they keep the 50% prevalence and uh, to get the maximum sample size so most of the people they say they will take 200 384 people and this formula works out that you know when you 50% and then um, then you have about 10% of that as the uh, precision and then you know you end up with something like 384 and that's what most of the people write but then you'll find it's, it's, it's a wrong actual formula to be used and then it's not bad idea to meet a statistician at the beginning you know um, to get your samples so is calculated and we encourage you to do that but then when you when you meet the uh, statistician uh what you should take with you is the what i call the local studies on particular on particular particular subjects so that you know there are some information available mm, if you can't get all of the local studies then there are not been done much, many studies in the local local setting and uh, even regional study it would do like you know if you can get from neighboring countries and then they they they, they might be useful 
and if you don't have actually that you know you might you can go to what's called international international studies and uh, sometimes that we tend to use what's called expert opinion and if you say that you know i mean in my in my clinical clinical practice i find that 50% of people are, are not compliant with this particular medication and then um, if you can get from the expert and then as expert opinion and particularly if it has been written somewhere then of course you know you can use it as a, as, as evidence based for you to cal calculate sample size mm. then other instances what we do is that you know we generally do a pilot study and then uh, in order to calculate sample size so we do a pilot study maybe about 100 people and then get that data and then um, use that for the calculation of sample size I should give you an example. Um, let's say somebody wants to knowledge, it's a knowledge about complications of diabetes among clinic attendees. Now, um, for for this particular thing, and what information should you use to calculate sample size? Uh, like, you know, proportion of patients with diabetes in the clinic? I don't think that's right. A proportion of patients with complications of diabetes in the clinic? No, even that is not going to be right. Maybe proportion of patients with poor knowledge about the complications of diabetes in the clinic. That's what you should be looking for, because that is directly what directly applies to your, your, your objectives and not the about to. So we have to be very careful. To make sure that uh, that you know what information that you take with the statistician when you're going to uh, calculate sample size. So in summary, I would say there's a scarcity of clinical research in Sri Lanka. Actually, we are way behind when you compare with the other other neighboring countries. And particularly in clinical research, and this is very, very, very vividly seen in uh, particularly the COVID-19. And you compare the research done in other countries and amount of research done in Sri Lanka, and we are way, way behind actually. And the trainees should show there's some enthusiasm, learn the different components and steps in the research, and disseminate their findings. And um, I think they should be, they should be there. The, the, the research culture should be developed among, among clinicians. And these, um, what I call the skills, need to be inculcated in their training program, maybe much earlier than what we are doing right now. And uh, so make sure that they, they learn different components of different steps in, in a research and also particular findings. I think that's my last slide. So thank you very much. Thank you for anyway, giving a clear picture of what you expect from our PGM trainees. Uh, you know, we get a very, very clear picture what uh, they should do. And uh, so thank you on behalf of the College of Physicians. We are supposed to give you a certificate of appreciation, but uh, you probably, if you're not, as you're not here, you'll probably hand it over when you, whenever you come to the college. Sure. Uh, uh, we are waiting for questions. I'll again tell the audience if there are any questions, please type it and send it through the link into your text box and uh, send it through. We can't see any questions at the moment. Yeah. Uh, while we are waiting for questions, I'll ask you something, you know, the problem is that, uh, Sarat, you know, we, uh, we I, I find that, you know, there is you no, know, no sort of uh, real need for them to uh, do good research because it's just a matter of getting a research done f to complete their training board certification. You see, yeah. they're not, uh, you know, they're not keen to carry out good research because they just, they're not keen on public, most of them are not keen on publishing it. Eh? Most of the research that's done by our trainees are not published and yeah. they just, want to do some uh, research, some descriptive, mainly, mainly descriptive studies, yeah. just to complete their, you know, uh, requirements. Yeah. So is there any way of uh, tackling that problem? I think, uh, as you said that, you know, what they do is actually go through the motions and uh, rather than sort of, you know, I mean, they get the taste of doing research and finding something new and then publishing. And uh, as I said earlier that, you know, see their names in a very and it's a reputed journal as a, as an author. Uh, this is uh, what what happens is even in that one year given, and they don't utilize that one year to do a research. And what they do is that in the last moment, last two months or so, they hurry a, a research proposal and then send to the board of study get the approval, and then um, a little bit of data collection, 
and then publish it. So it is very hurried process and also they don't enjoy that. And they see is there a bit of, you know, a trouble and a little bother like in their, which has come in between their board certification and their training. Um, but then I think as clinician, what we should do is we should introduce our trainees into the research very early and get them involved in our research. That may be a reason because on their own, they may not be able to do research. Maybe that you can make them a part of your research team and then uh, they probably can manage that with, with their clinical training. And so they get a taste of uh, research very early on. And that may be another way to do that, introduce them into research very early. Yeah, it, it could be form, one more formative, formative uh, research assessment. And if there can be some sort of assessment of their research and giving some grading or whatever, I think things might improve, I think, in my yeah. opinion. Yeah. yeah. And there's a question from Dr. Pasin Fernando. He says, are the re trainees expected to carry out research only in their field of PG training? That is there. He's asking, is he a medicine trainee? Is he expected to do research only in the related to medicine in this field uh, of medicine? You know? Not certainly, not certainly. But if you go into for a research, you need to have some background knowledge on that particular subject. Let's say you are going to do something on the, let's say, healthcare management while you are doing the doing medicine and maybe the cost of a drug evaluation, cost effectiveness or patient management plans or something like that. But you have to have, you have, to have a, a, some kind of understanding, at least the basic principles in that area. So without that, it's very, very difficult to do a research in that. Um, so uh, I believe that uh, if you have this expertise, a little bit of extra knowledge on, on certain things, and certainly there's no limit that, you know, no one will prevent you doing a research. Let's say you are doing medicine and doing a research in neurology and on a stroke uh, or something like that, you know, I mean, certainly no one is going to, going to prevent you doing that. But you might have a basic understanding and the basic knowledge to do that. So it basically, you want to improve on the research methodology and things like that hmm. rather than the, the area yes. of research. Yeah. Yes. Okay. Yes. Okay, in the absence of uh, any more questions, I will like to thank on behalf of the College of Physicians, uh, Professor Atle Kambusam for contributing to our research methodology session. Thank you, Sarat. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I appreciate it. Thank you.